plan to do a book on Craig, another in cold blood, if you listen to her talk about it. You spoke with her then? I asked. I did, on all three of her visits, half an hour or so the first time. How did she seem to you? What was your impression? Warden Croc moved his head back and forth as if he were weighing his answer. Finally, he spoke. She seemed like a fan. Honestly, I wondered if she and Craig had something going before he was caught. Chapter 37 I returned to Washington early the following morning, having already passed along the news about Tess Olson, the Hallmark card in Craig's cell, and the possibility that Kyle may have had a relationship with Olson, or even with the killer in D.C. But more than anything else, I wondered what Kyle was planning. Bree had pulled together a small forensic team focusing on the blog leads she was chasing down. An agent named Brian Kitzmiller from the FBI's cyber unit had been assigned to us and was more than willing to come on board. The audience killer case had already caught his attention. Bree asked Kitzmiller for the earliest possible meeting after he'd had a chance to go over the blog. Kitzmiller gave us a four-hour turnaround, which meant he was fast. Another good sign that we had everybody's attention on this case. We showed up at the Hoover Building close to three. I certainly knew my way around there, though I'd never done much work with the cyber unit and had never met Kitzmiller. I'd heard of him, however, and knew he had a reputation as a puzzle solver. Come on in. Even seated in front of a work terminal, he was obviously very tall and gawky-looking, with the brightest orange hair I had ever seen in my life. This part of the unit was a low-ceilinged room on the second floor, a few floors below my old office. Everyone sat in wide, stall-like cubicles with their backs to the center, where a large octagonal conference table was strewn with papers, files, and laptop computers. People did work here. Good sign. A glass wall separated the unit from the busy corridor outside. Bree, Samson, and I grabbed chairs and sat down in Kitzmiller's stall. He was about my age, fit, and with that blinding head of hair. I can't really source any of the audio, he said, but I did compare the screams on what the blogger calls Channel 2 against the videotape from the original crime scene. It's almost definitely a match. But that's not quite the same as a forensic link between the blog and the killer. Theoretically, anyone could have posted this. You mean if someone else had access to the recording, I said. We're all in agreement that the audio is original, right? Sure, he said. So it's either your suspect or someone who was given access by the suspect. Hard to tell about that for sure yet. Let's focus on one thing at a time, Bree said. You told me on the phone that the blog was posted from Georgetown University. Is that right? Or at least through Georgetown. That's the basic problem I'm seeing already, Bree. Whoever put up the blog knew how to cover his or her tracks fairly well. Proxy server? Samson asked. His little niches of expertise always surprised me. Kitzmiller smiled appreciatively at Samson. But then he shook his head. Negative. Worse, actually. He used an open proxy. Universities are notoriously easy marks for this kind of thing. Any boob can remotely attach their IP address from anywhere, and wham, you've got an untraceable site. All I can get you is a location, nothing about identity. Any suggestions at all? Bree asked. We really need your help on this. Sure. I understand your frustration, Detective. My suggestion is that you get totally involved on your end. Jump in the deep water with me. We'll keep paddling around here, but you'll be glad if you do some stirring of your own. Believe me, a whole lot of detritus turns up online. You'd be surprised what you might find. Honestly, I don't know the first thing about cyber forensics, Bree said. You don't have to. I'm not talking about cracking code here. I'm talking about a large community that needs to be canvassed. The whole blogosphere. Blogosphere? Kitzmiller started pulling up several new windows at once, layered over one another on the screen to show us what he was getting at. First of all, 
we've got everyone who posted responses to the original blog. There was the My Reality site, for example. It's already been taken down, but there were more than three dozen separate screen names for people who had replied to at least one of his entries. So that's a pretty good start. You remember the old shampoo commercial? You tell two friends, and they tell two friends, and so on, and so on. Same thing here. Some number of people read this, then turn around and talk about it on their own blogs, and the scope goes up exponentially. Chat rooms, too. Now, add that to the fact that you've got a killer who apparently likes to be in the spotlight. There's a good chance he'll stay a part of the community in some way. People intersect. You find the right intersection, maybe you solve your case, find your killer. Go into the detective's hall of fame. That's a lot of ifs, Bree said. I don't like ifs and maybes. People had been talking about cyberspace as the new frontier in law enforcement for years now. It looked like I was about to get my first extensive taste of it. Kitzmiller ran a simple Google blog search for us to illustrate his point. He searched audience killer and got a whole screen full of responses. Wow, said Bree. I'm kind of impressed already. Or maybe I should say depressed. That's a lot of detritus. Samson added, Fuck, it's an epidemic. You notice he never uses that full title on his own site. That's probably why you hadn't found it earlier. Even so, right here you've got more than 80 other strands that mention him, and two specifically dedicated to the subject. And he presumably hasn't even hit three homicides yet. Does the fact that he's courting the attention speed all this up? I asked. Sure it does. There's a voracious audience for all this stuff on the Internet. Most people say they abhor the killing, and a lot of them actually do, I'm sure. What you end up with is a mix of folks with legitimate forensic interest, people who want to know more but maybe for the wrong reason, and then people who just plain get off on it all. This guy is their dream come true. No one's ever been so accessible. Not while he was still this active. Bree spoke quietly, working it out in her head. So? He uses other people to help turn himself into the thing he wants to be. Kitzmiller nodded and pulled up another window, the official Jeffrey Dahmer fan club site. Pick your poison. He wants to be Dahmer. He wants to be Ted Bundy. He wants to be the Zodiac Killer. No, he wants to be a much bigger star, I said. I think he wants to be bigger than any of the others. Including Kyle Craig? I had to wonder. How the hell does Kyle fit in? Chapter 38 I was already frustrated about the case. Plus, I was suffering from Bree deprivation. I was concerned that I'd have trouble focusing at work that week, so I decided to tape my sessions. Just in case. Just to be safe. Anthony DeMeo, the Desert Storm vet, did something unusual for him, which was talk in depth about his combat experience. I sat and reviewed the tape again over lunch at my desk. As I listened, I could picture Anthony, ruggedly good-looking, still in shape, a quiet man, though. We didn't have sufficient support on the ground. The CO didn't give a rat's ass. We had a mission. That's all he cared about, he said. How long had you been there at that point? Silence. Then, ground attack started end of the month. So a couple of weeks, I guess. I was becoming more and more convinced that something really bad had happened to him during Desert Storm something that could be a key to Anthony's difficulties, maybe even an incident he'd repressed. The balance in this case was between not wanting to push too hard and a gut feeling that he wasn't going to stick with the therapy for long, especially if he didn't think we were making enough progress. I did some research, I said on the tape. You were 24th Infantry Division, right? This was just before you all started toward Basra. How did you know that? It's part of history. You were part of history. The information isn't very hard to find, Anthony. 
Is there anything that happened there that you don't want to talk about? To me, or anyone else? Maybe there is. Probably some stuff I don't want to get into. I don't blame anyone for what happened, though. His speech was faster now and clipped, as though he wanted to get past this part. Blame anyone for what? I asked. For any of the shit that happened. You know, I enlisted on my own. I wanted to go. I waited, but there was no elaboration. That's it for now, Anthony said then. A little too much, too soon. Next time. I need to ease into this, Doc. Sorry about that. I clicked off the tape recorder and sat back in my chair, thinking. I knew he was losing ground lately, even with the subsidized housing he had. Another month or two of unemployment could be a real problem for him. People like Anthony DeMeo slipped through the cracks all the time. I rubbed my eyes hard and poured myself another cup of coffee. There was a lot to think about. Maybe too much. I had one more client coming, and then later that afternoon, a meeting at police headquarters. A big one. Chapter 39 It was time to trade on my reputation and laurels in a way I'd never done before. I knew the chief of police, Terence Hoover, would take a meeting if I asked, especially since I had cleared it through the chief of detectives first. I was less sure if Hoover would agree to the ridiculousness I was about to propose to him. We'd have to see about that. Alex, come in, sit down, he said as I stood like a moke in his doorway. A college wrestling photo on the wall behind him showed the younger Hoover at the University of Maryland and explained where that crushing handshake of his came from. I haven't heard from you in a long time. I appreciate you seeing me, Chief. Needless to say, there's something on my mind. Hoover smiled. So we're skipping the idle chit-chat, huh? Okay. What are you after, Alex? Nothing too complicated. Just a job. Hoover blinked and ducked his double chin. A job? Well, shit, Alex, that is a surprise. I thought you were coming to ask me for something. Instead, you're here to offer me something. That was a relief to hear. Thanks for saying that, Chief. I guess I'll keep offering then. Please do. You're on a roll. I definitely want to hear the rest of the pitch. Here it went. Some cops talk about wanting to make a difference. I guess I'd say that I believe I can do more good than harm, and that's a reasonable objective. I want to come back on the force, but in a limited capacity. I'd like to work the Major K squad, but outside of the regular rotation. Specific assignments only. I've been consulting on the Kennedy Center and Connecticut Avenue murder cases already, and if any of this is agreeable to you, it would be a seamless re-entry for me. I know the team, and I think I could be an asset. Hoover laughed out loud. I've heard some pretty good speeches in here, but that one goes on the short list. He pointed at me. You know you can afford to be this cocky, cause you know damn well I'm gonna say yes. Just figured I'd lay it out there. He stood up and so did I. Well, the answer is yes. Let me have Arlene call recruiting and I'll speak to the superintendent myself. We'll work something out. Superintendent of Detectives Ramon Davies I knew would be my boss on the Major K Squad. Davies was above Thor Richter and if I could get this investigation taken out of Richter's supervision, we'd be able to move a lot more freely on it. I think I just cashed in every chit I've got, I said, shaking Terence Hoover's hand again. It'll be good to have you on this one, he said. I hear they're calling him the audience killer. Since I had come up with the name, I was tempted to smile, but didn't. Audience killer, huh? I guess that sounds about right. Chapter 40 I hooked up with Bree and Samson back at the Daily Building that evening. I'd already been given an office there, and it was doubling as a nerve center for the audience killer case. It felt a little like a college dorm room, with the three of us crammed in there together. I'd never worked this way before, 
quite so cooperatively.